one of the popular metaphors in the New Testament is that the Christian life is that of being in a race, running a race. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, those who run in a race, Galatians 5, 7, he says, you were running well. Philippians 2, 16 says, I did not run in vase. I did not run in vain. Sorry about that. The Christian life is a long-distance obstacle course requiring perseverance, requiring endurance. Now, I've often said that the Christian life is a marathon, but I don't think that does justice to the Christian life. Now, you run a marathon, that's pretty good. It's 26.2 miles, okay? That's quite a feat. But the Christian life is a marathon combined with the steeplechase. Well, what is the steeplechase? The steeplechase is only 1.86 miles. But in that 1.86 miles, you have to jump over 28 hurdles and run through seven pools of water. So it's full of obstacles. It's grueling. It's enduring. So the Christian life is a 26.2 marathon combined with obstacles and water courses that we have to go through on the way. It's a long haul. The situation for the recipients of the letter to Hebrews was this. Some of them were on the verge of quitting the Christian race. See, they thought it was just a 100-yard dash. They didn't realize that they had 26-plus miles to go with a lot of other obstacles in front of them. So the person who writes the letter to Hebrews, be it Paul, Barnabas, or somebody else, has a great pastoral concern for his readers, for his audience. And he says this in Hebrews 2.1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. Hebrews 3.12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Hebrews 4.14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The recipients of this letter needed to have endurance. And so Hebrews 11 that we've looked at in the last six weeks or so, the writer gives numerous examples from the Old Testament of men and women who endured, who kept going, who didn't hit the, half, the halfway point and give up or quit. I've called these spiritual heroes. How I got the idea for this sermon was... A couple months ago, during the lockdown, you know, some of, some of the doctor's offices had little signs outside of it. I'm sure y'all have seen them. Heroes work here, right? You know, men and women in the medical profession on the front line dealing with people. But then, a couple weeks ago, I passed a clinic, and they got a new sign now. Superheroes work here. Going to one-up the heroes, right? Well, listen. We have a lot of heroes in the faith. We looked at them through Hebrews chapter 11. But we only have one superhero. That's Jesus Christ. And today we're going to look at that superhero, Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. I'm calling this keep running. Because you need to make up your mind that you are going to continue in the Christian life running with endurance. Endurance. And Jesus Christ provides the ultimate example of endurance. So how do we keep running? Well, first of all, we must look at past winners. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, many people take Hebrews chapter 11 about this cloud of witnesses, and they Say, this is the interpretation, that all these men and women from the Old Testament are now up in heaven like spectators looking down on us. And we're, we're out there on the field trying to play, right? 
That's not what he's saying. They're not witnesses as far as looking down upon us, but the idea is that they are witnesses is that they witness to us. They are examples to us of walking by faith, of continuing, of enduring, of not quitting. So they're examples, not onlookers. They've borne witness to the faithfulness of God. And their witness to us is that it can be done. You can run this marathon, steeplechase, because many of them suffered while they were on earth. Yet none of them received all the promises that God had made to them, but now all of them are in an eternal place with a never-ending peace, joy, and delight, and each one of them heard Jesus speaking to them, well done, good and faithful servant. So when, when we go through difficulties, it's often easy to lose sight of the big picture. But we're not alone in this. Many have already made it through life with much more difficult circumstances than any of us are going through. So here's the first thing for you to keep running. You must remember past winners to remind us that you can do it. A second thing to keep running is that you need, we need to look at ourselves. Now, let me let you know what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that you need to be pre preoccupied with yourself, with narcissism, which our society is steep with. Narcissism is this looking at yourself constantly. It's all about you. You think the world and the universe revolves around you. I'm not talking about looking at yourselves as far as being narcissistic and taking, you know, Hundreds of selfies of you every day. I remember last year, Laurie and I went to a baseball game in Milwaukee. And there were these two teenage girls in front of us, young teenagers. The first six innings, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> I bet they took a hundred pictures of themselves. Look at them. So when I say look at yourselves, I'm not talking about this narcissistic culture that we live in, but in the sense that we are the participants in this race that we want, and the, and, and the conditions that we run in. So he says, verse 1, Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance. This is the main verb in these four verses I'm looking at. That's what he wants to get, a, get across. And so two things I want to look at as we look at ourselves. First, the race that we run in. And second, the hindrances that we face. Six things about this race that each one of us run in called the Christian life. The first thing is that it takes endurance. Run with endurance, with determination, with perseverance to keep going, to not surrender when circumstances don't go your way, when afflictions come in, when problems develop. Run with endurance. But the second thing it takes is the strength to run the race is not just in ourselves and me doing it, but the strength to run the race is by the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's the reason why we can endure. The perseverance of the saints doesn't mean we persevere because we, 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 we tighten up and we put our fists together and we grin and bear it. But the perseverance of the saints, why we persevere is because God causes us to persevere. The Spirit is with us. He's in us. He gives us strength. Paul, uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, as he prays for the church at Ephesus, he says that you, he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man. So this race that we're all running in, it takes endurance. It takes strength from the Holy Spirit. A third thing, it is personal. The race that is set before us. Each one of us in here is running the Christian race. But each one of us in here is running that Christian race in our own lane. With our own boundary. Stay in your lane, bro. What do I mean by that? That 
you run this race based on your personal life experiences, where God has you right now, and nobody else is, can run that but you. Now, we're all the same in this, in this race. It's not like, oh, I got a better lane than you do. I'm on the inside. You're way out the outside. No, we all have a lane, but it's a personal lane. It's the race set before you that God's going to give you the grace to continue to run well, to run to the very end, to endure. A fourth thing, it's personal, but here's the fourth thing. You don't always run alone. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is this habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, we all run this race by ourselves. Nobody can run it but you. But we got a, many, many runners around you to encourage you. Live runners, not just witnesses, dead witnesses from Hebrews 11. So in your training, as we're training, we're all in training. None of us achieve in this lifetime. We're running by ourselves, but we're called to have others around us, not just be solo runners all the time. And as he says, especially all the more as you see the day drawing near, the sooner that Jesus Christ might come back. We're called to encourage each other in this race. Here's a fifth thing. We're not just only to run the race and kind of lollygag and float our way through it, but we're called to run the race to win the race. Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 9.24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we in, an imperishable. Paul was talking about the, the games in Greek, the Greek uh, games, athletic games. And of course, there's only one winner. They received this little wreath on their head that would die probably in a few days. Paul's saying the prize that we're going to get will never fade away or, or corrupt. They're called rewards. They're called crowns. Now, when you come to Christ, God puts his spirit in you, gives you new life that can't be taken away. But these rewards, these crowns, are based on how did you live your life after you came to Christ. And that will determine the prizes that you get, the rewards that you get in eternity. Now, he says that only one receives the prize. But that's talking about physical race on this earth. He's saying to each one of us, everyone's going to get a prize and that prize is not going to be based on that you beat other people, but that prize is going to be based on how did you do? How faithful were you in all that God had given to you? Now, when we talk about winning, we're not in competition with anyone in here. Look around. Nobody in this room is your competition. No other church is our competition. It's all the same. We're all running. We're not trying to do outdo other churches, outdo other Christians. Because our competition is Satan, the world, and our own flesh. That's our competition. And so he says, as you run this race, you run with self-control. You discipline yourself, just like any athlete would, before you are involved in, a, in a, an event. You want to be at peak performance. So there's this aspect that you run, but you run to win. You exercise self-control. As Paul says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. Then a sixth thing he tells us about the race is there are no shortcuts in this race. You know, there are not, you know, I'm going to give you all a sermon next week, three easy ways to become a great Christian. No such thing. No shortcuts. Back in 1980, uh, during the Boston Marathon, a lady named Rosie Ruiz was declared the winner. 
Well, eight days later, they stripped the crown from her because they found out that she didn't run the race. At the last half mile, she snuck in and, and ended up winning. We don't sneak in. There are no shortcuts. So the race, this Christian race that we're all running in, takes endurance, takes strength. It is personal. You don't run alone. You run to win, and there are no shortcuts. But here's the second thing. The hindrances that we all face while running this race called life, Christian life, this Christian race. There's two hindrances. He says, lay aside these hindrances. Strip off what is unnecessary. And what are those two hindrances? The first is, he says, encumbrances. That is bulk or mass. Now, bulk or mass is not bad in and of itself, especially if you are NFL offensive linemen. They want to get as big as they can, right? But I've never seen anyone run a marathon wearing army boots and a big wool coat. Or you don't see somebody running a 100-yard dash, you know, with a 20-pound vest, weighted vest on them. You want to get rid of those encumbrances. Now, we're not exactly sure what, what the writer was speaking of right here, but I think some possible encumbrances to lay aside indifferent attitude, procrastination, impatience, Laziness. But not only encumbrances impede our walk, but he also says the sin, the second thing, which so easily entangles us. Now, any sin can entangle us. Any sin can trip you up, cause you to fall. But I think the particular sin that he's talking about right here is the sin of unbelief. Because in Hebrews chapter 10, 11, and 12, that's what he's talking about. That's the context. And the sin of unbelief is not trusting God. Allowing fear to rule over you. That's what was happening to these believers. They were going through a difficult time. They were afraid. They were being persecuted as Harassed, some of them lost their property. None of them had been put to death yet. So fear had gripped them. So the writer says, keep running. Look at the past winners who've gone before you. Look at yourself. This race that we're running, and in this race that we're running, know full well that there's going to be encumbrances. Remember, it's a marathon combined with the steeplechase. There's going to be a lot of obstacles, a lot of difficulties. So look at past winners, look at ourselves, but he now gives a third thing. Look at Jesus. Jesus is the only gold medal winner. Jesus is the only superhero And he is the ultimate example of how we should run this race of faith. Verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. The tense of the verb is present tense, ongoing. We're always looking at Jesus. See, coming to Jesus is not this one-time event that happened somewhere in your past, and then from now on, you just kind of do what you want. Now, the idea of faith, fixing your eyes on Jesus, is lifelong, continuing to look at Jesus. An attitude of faith, not a single act of faith. Now, you can't run successfully while you're looking around. If you're in a 100-yard dash, you can't be running waving at the crowd. Or you can't run looking down at your feet, seeing how they look. Oh, those are nice shoes I have on. Or looking around at the competitors. No, you run to the tape. You run to the finish line. Last year, Laurie and I were taking a walk with my granddaughter, and, you know, we're walking, and she's running, you know, looking around. I said, come here, watch where you're going. Well, sure enough, boom, she goes down. 
We're called to run with a purpose. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, who the Bible says right here is the author and perfecter of faith. See, it's faith in Jesus from the beginning to the end. Author means the idea of a trailblazer, the one who's gone before us and cut a path and says to everyone behind, follow me. This is the way to go. Keep your eyes on me. If you follow me, you're going to be fine. And he's the perfecter of our faith because in Jesus, faith reached its perfection. It reached its fullness, its wholeness. Because Jesus' whole life was characterized by unbroken and unquestioning faith in the Father. So he is our example. And he did it because of the joy set before him. Something to be shared with those who gave his life as a sacrifice for sin. Because he knew the cross was going to be horrific. But he knew after the cross is where joy was to be found. That he was completing the Father's will. That he was going to be that he was going to rise from the dead and eventually ascend into heaven where he's now exalted. That through that he was going to bring many people to glory with himself. And that one day all those people that come to him are going to stand in the same joy that he has right now in eternity. And because of this joy, it says he endured the cross. He endured all that it demanded emotionally. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, when he was on the cross. All his dignity stripped, naked, people down at the the foot of the cross, cursing at him, hurling insults at him, mocking him, spitting at him. Physically, crucifixion was a horrible way to die. Slowly but surely, it took the life out of you. And then add to that the spiritual that he had to endure as he became a sin offering, as he took the judgment of God upon sin upon himself in the place of sinners. And he did all this willingly. And it says how he did it, despising the shame. That is, the the, the disgrace of the cross Jesus disregarded as something not worthy to be taken account of. He didn't let shame define him. And listen, all of us in here, shame is part of the human life. Maybe for some of you, might, by just me saying that, something jumps into your mind. But Jesus would not allow that to overwhelm him, to define him. He despised it. He put it aside. Why? To sacrifice his life. And after that, it says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Right now, right this very moment, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And as Hebrews 7.25 says, that he always lives to make intercessions for his people. He's praying for you. Right now. That's his whole purpose, is to pray for the church, to pray for his followers. Verse 3, for consider him who has endured such hostilities by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider Christ. Think it over. Meditate upon it is what it's saying. Occupy your mind with Christ. Never cease to be amazed at who Christ was, his person, and what he came to do, his sacrifice on the cross. In a little while, when we go to the communion table, that's exactly what we're going to do. But it's not just when we have communion. Daily. That Jesus Christ would die for me. That Jesus Christ would love me. Meditate on who Christ is. Paul writing in Ephesians 3, 17, again, praying for the church at Ephesus, he says this. 
And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as, a trust, as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand, as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, and how high his love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves, though it is so great that you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. Consider Jesus. Think of all the hostility from sinners his whole life. People tried to trap him, embarrass him, mock him, slander him. At the end of his life, he was betrayed and they killed him. But it says two times that he endured. Verse 2, he endured the cross. Verse 3, he endured hostility. And why? Well, it says so that you do not grow, you do not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus doesn't ask any more of us than he experienced himself. He's not asking you to do something that he didn't do. And so he knows exactly what you are going through whenever you're going through it. And so as we consider Jesus, as we pour out our heart to Jesus, as we cry to Jesus, and so we won't quit, won't give up, won't walk away. And that's exactly what he was telling these Hebrew Christians. Consider Jesus. Because he is the supreme inspirer of faith. Jesus is the only superhero. And he closes by telling them and telling us, you can do it. Verse 4. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. The recipients of this letter went through difficult times of persecution, yet none of them had died yet for their faith. They'd been mocked, they'd been scorned, some had lost some property, but none were put to death. So because they were still alive, the writer urges them to continue running the race well. Now just as they were called to continue to run the race that they can do it. I believe we can too. Now, if I was preaching somewhere else in the world, I might not be able to preach this verse like this. Because there's some brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through far worse, who are literally being put to death. Now, I know none of us in America yet of being put to death because of our faith. As much as we may not like things going on, Jesus tells us, you can do it. I didn't give up. I didn't quit when things got difficult. And neither should you. Now, maybe some of you today are weary. You're weary of running this race called life. Two different ways. One way might be because some of you are still spectators looking at the race. Here's what I mean. We're all in this race called life. But not all of us are in the race of the Christian life. Some of you are still looking on the outside, looking in, and saying, man, look, I'm trying the best I can do. I mean, I'm working hard. I try to be good to people. I go to church every now and then, maybe sometimes say a prayer. But you've never, ever brought that bag of sin that all of us carry around. You've never brought it to the cross. You've never brought it to Jesus. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and take that bag away and put it on himself and take that load off of you. Maybe he's worn you out. Now, there's others in here, and hopefully most, if not all. You've come to Jesus. You've given him that bag, but life gets hard, folks. Amen? Amen. 
Life gets hard. There's difficulty. There's worry. There's anxiety. How am I going to do this? Where am I going to get that? What about my kids? Blah, blah, blah. On and on. The responsibility. And that'll wear you out. So wherever you are today, the answer is the same. It's the very words of Jesus that he says in come on, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus speaking. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now notice this, five times Jesus uses personal pronouns. Me, I, my, me, I. See, Jesus is not saying, come to a certain religion. Come perform certain rituals. Come follow certain rules and regulations. No, he's saying, come to me in a personal relationship. I want to be with you. I am a living Savior. I rose from the dead. And I will be with you from start of the race to the very finish line. When you no longer walk by faith, not, but you'll start walking by sight. Christ is always there for you. So if you're weary today, you're like everybody. You're no different. All, all, all runners in this race get tired. But we all need to look to Jesus, no matter what. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray.